so hello, and um, it's great to be with you uh, today, Frank Cooper, CMO of uh, BlackRock. Real pleasure to be talking. And the thing that um, we've talked about before and that I'd love us to talk more about today is the idea of the conscious leader, something I know you care about um, very deeply. Before we get into that conversation, can you give me just a little sense of your personal journey and the context that, that takes you into how you've developed your thinking as a conscious leader? Sure, sure. Sarah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, you know, as I mentioned to you before, I'm so excited about this topic of conscious leadership. So uh, I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to speak with you about this. Um, but so my personal journey and, and those who know me um, find it kind of a little bit of a strange journey because I've been through I'm trained as a lawyer. I've been through entertainment. I, I've worked in technology. I've worked uh, many years at PepsiCo uh, for a consumer goods company. Uh, I was chief creative officer and chief marketing officer at BuzzFeed. And here I am now at BlackRock, a, a financial services company. And it seems like an extraordinarily strange journey, um, but there is a thread that goes through it all. And I was really fortunate early in my career to have someone pull me aside and, and, and give me some advice that changed the entire course of my career. And so I was a second year law student and, um, and, I, and we were working on a case involving Tetris, the game Tetris. And um, a Russian scientist had created the game. Uh, I flew over to Russia with, with this litigation partner who had been practicing for over 20 years. So we spent a lot of time together which was unusual at the time. And I was really fortunate because he said, okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about you. And I know what you want to do. You want to teach and all this other stuff. But um, let me just tell you one thing. And, and, and this is the only thing I'm going to say to you. And this is from all my experience. You need to figure out what energizes you in your personal life. And then connect that with your professional life. So if you, what's going to happen, you're going to do well professionally. But over time, the more uh, work you put in, the better you get. If you don't connect the two things, your personal interest will go to the wayside and it will be virtually impossible for you to have a greater sense of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And that started me on the whole journey of looking inward and thinking about what energizes me, what gives me a sense of fulfillment, what makes me feel like I'm actually making a contribution bigger than my, myself. And that set me along the path. And Sarah, everywhere I went, I, I used that lens to both determine whether I wanted to join the company, but also to define my experience within that company. I did it at Motown, I did it at Def Jam, I did it at BuzzFeed, I did it at PepsiCo, I'm doing it right here now at, at BlackRock. And uh, we can go into some of those more if we want to, but, um, but each of those I felt were purpose-driven companies, but also my sense of purpose was fulfilled through those companies. Yeah, yeah. oh, that's great. Thank you so much for that, Frank. Um, tell me a little bit about um, the sense of purpose that drives you then, how you've taken that advice and then turned that into uh, the motivation for the things that you've, you've been doing since. Yeah, so what I, what I realized is that I enjoy um, helping people expand their own potential and, 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 and unlocking their own potential and both as individuals, but also as a, as a, a collective. And so it, you take Motown and Def Jam, for example. Um, for me, that was about unlocking people's potential. Motown was about taking black culture and putting it into the mainstream. Um, before that happened, it actually was something that was completely foreign to people, it was separate. And, um, but Barry Gordy's genius was that he said, I'm going to help uh, address you in a certain way. I'm going to cultivate the music in a certain way. Um, you're going to speak in a certain way but where you maintain the core integrity of who you are. But it's going to be able to connect to the broader culture. So that gave us Marvin Gaye and Diana Ross and Jackson 5 and The Temptations. And it became known as the sound of young America at the time massive impact on culture overall, but expanding the potential of all people, because suddenly you could see across and the people that you thought were the other were actually part of your life and became the soundtrack of your life. Uh, Def Jam, I felt like did it from the opposite perspective. They were not trying to assimilate to any, into anything at all, um, but it did expand people's potential because as more people started to distrust traditional institutions or felt like they didn't get from traditional institutions, what they needed to move forward. Um, what, what Def Jam and other hip hop labels did at their best, because there, there, there are issues with all, with all these labels, but at their best, they actually taught people, how do you overcome struggle? Like, how do you face adversity? How do you do it on your own? And, and, and a lot of the terms that we hear floating around now, like authenticity, uh, uh, a DIY, um, you can see the, the foundations of it within that music. 
you know, keeping it real was about authenticity. Um, you know, there are other terms about for, for do it on, on your own. And so that's, it was a playbook for a world where traditional institutions did not allow people to move forward, but that's unlocking their, their potential. And I can go on and on, you know, BuzzFeed was taking marginalized people, putting them on center stage. Um, PepsiCo was about performance with purpose. And, uh, and now at BlackRock, um, this idea of helping more and more people experience financial well-being. Financial inclusion and financial well-being to me is again, expanding people's potential on the individual level, but also collectively. And removing from what you're saying, some of the challenges in the way of being able to do that uh, and at scale from the kind of organizations that you've been involved in. I'm sorry, Sarah, say that again, repeat that. Uh, I, was, I was just reflecting on um, the challenges involved in that, removing those obstacles. Um, yeah. being able to do that at scale like you know it, I'm sure everyone who's listening to this has heard of all of the places that you've worked at and the impact that that can have yeah you know and, and, and I'll tell you this is what for me was a little bit of a revelation was that um, if you're looking to have the kind of impact that is systemic that's really going to move culture and, and, and move large part, parts of society or at least create momentum uh, within society you need a certain amount of scale and, and, and to move a scaled organization, you need to align people with some kind of foundational concept that everyone believes in. Call it purpose. Um, some people will call it mission. Some people will call it our, our, our North Star, our core aspiration. It's a spark that everyone rallies around. And, and, and that's the thing that if you have that, that center of gravity within the firm, it allows you to scale up because every other person in that firm has some connection to it. Uh, without it, you'll start to see frays and fragmentation, and, and some people will get really technocratic about um, how to move forward. Uh, and so um, the scale matters a lot. Uh, but I will say this, that any company and any person can contribute to it. And so scale matters in terms of having a, a visible impact uh, on, on, on a large level. Uh, but any person can actually contribute to it. And sometimes it's the smaller companies or the individual that can make the biggest difference. So I, I personally would encourage anyone, if you can find your sense of purpose connected to some institution, um, there's massive value in that for you personally, but it's the way I think things move forward. And I love that. And uh, the sense that we can um, all make a difference. Um, you just need to connect to the things that really uh, are meaningful for you and, and inspire you to do exactly. that. Um, tell me what tell me where you start you know you've been in these organizations you've had these roles um, you you've gone on that journey of connecting with your own sense of purpose and unlocking the potential in others how, how, what, what does day one look like <laughs> you mean as I go into a, a various organizations you know it's, it's, it's a common it's a it's a really interesting thing because it's a combination of the really practical and pragmatic mm -hmm. and the aspirational and and I often start with the practical and pragmatic. Um, so coming into a new company uh, and a new industry, because I've been across several industries, you have to learn um, the, the economics of the industry. How is money actually made? You know, um, what do people actually value today? Um, where do they see growth? So just that pragmatic uh, um, um, purview. Um, it's also, um, what are the term, what's the terminology? Uh, you know, and, and every single company I've been in, there's a list of acronyms that are bewildering at first but you start to learn it. Um, but the most important thing I try to do is I try to figure out how can I help, based on my experience and my expertise, help someone solve a problem within the company that they currently have. And by helping someone solve a problem, you immediately build affinity with that person. Um, it's like being in battle together. Yeah, uh, um, you, know, you come out of it, there's some affinity with that person because of that shared experience. And so I try to identify what are some of the problems that people are facing and how can I, I help solve it? And I put that all on the pragmatic and, and, and practical side. Mm -hmm. Then I look at, um, so that's the structure. This is where things are, where are things going? And what has not happened to this industry that has happened elsewhere? So if you look at financial services, for example, uh, when I came on board, um, there really wasn't outside of the investment process itself, there wasn't a, a, uh, kind of a deep affinity and integration of digital into the experience. Digital had not disrupted the experience. There's still a lot of manual 
uh, exercises going on, you know, massive Excel sheets uh, that were filled manually. And, uh, and given that every other industry has been disrupted in some fundamental way by digital technology, my view was that that's coming to financial services. How can we get ahead of that and not look at it as a threat, but as a, a massive opportunity? How can we apply machine learning and reinforcement learning to think about the way we uh, personalize for investors and customers? Um, you know, how can we uh, develop better user experiences that are on the mobile device? Um, what are some of the, the kind of conceptual things that, that um, have affected the way people actually even want to ingest information? I think our experience with mobile, for example, has, has changed that. People want it to be short form, highly visual, intuitive, and shareable. So what does that mean for an industry that likes to write white papers with lots of footnotes? And so uh, translating that into kind of the, the, the cultural and uh, uh, the cultural movement in, uh, of, of what's happening uh, in general, I think is, has been one of the advantages I've had uh, and something I try to apply in each industry I go into and in each company. Mm, I find that really interesting. The idea of being able to discern patterns from the different places that you've been and therefore being able to, you know, spot what you might need to apply in a new situation. But you, I think in different ways, we're talking about culture a lot, culture that we live in and also the culture of the organization. You know, I need to understand the definitions, the terms that this organization uses in order to be able to create change. And I need to connect that with what's going on outside in the world in a, in a useful way. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Sarah, it's so funny you say that because it is about culture, both internal culture at the firm itself. Mm -hmm. Like how do people get things done? Um, you know, what's not on the paper? Um, you know, there's an or chart, you know, but how, how do things actually happen? Um, you know, what's important? What do they value? What do they remember? Like what, you know, memories often will tell you a lot about, uh, about a culture. So understanding that internal culture is so important, but I also spend a lot of time on the external culture. And, and by that, not just the culture of the industry, culture in general, you know, what's urgent and important to people in culture at large? How are people shifting the way they think? How are they grouping together? You know, one, one example is, um, and, and I did this at PepsiCo, you know, culturally we uh, marketers have often thought about traditional demographics as age, gender, income, geographic location, and ethnicity. And they'll say, well, that's a good proxy for how people think and behave. And that probably was true for a very long time. But now that we're so interconnected and relationships are so fluid and um, people can group together in ways that uh, cross geographic boundaries and, and age boundaries and gender boundaries, um, that is no longer the case. And so what's interesting is culturally, we actually have the opportunity to think about groupings, the, the individual collective segments in a very different way. You know, shared interests and shared actions. Um, and you're looking at the rituals within that group that, um, that could be very different, the symbols that matter to them. I just think that's an exciting unlock, but that's starting from the outside in culture and then bringing that back in. Yeah, no, that makes a per a perfect sense to, to, to me. And I, I'm interested thinking about culture again in uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, obviously um, a really, really important topic and, and one I know I, I know that you care about. Um, give me a little bit of a sense of the different perspectives you've been able to, to bring to, to that as, a, as, as a, a conversation that's so alive and especially right now. Yeah, look, um, and it's always tricky. I'll say this, you know, uh, I'm a black executive and people would say, okay, well, well, are you saying this out of self-interest or experience? Here, but here's what I believe about diversity, equity, and inclusion on a fundamental level. People often think about it as solely benefiting Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, and that it's somehow a zero-sum game, that if they benefit, others will not benefit. I truly believe that if you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion as unlocking potential in people, the unrealized potential in people, we actually all benefit from that. Uh, we all learn from that. Um, we can all expand from, from, from that. And so, so I'm a big believer that DEI is not some isolated silo of experience. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is about improving the entire organization, but also improving our society. And so, but when I look back at it, and, I, and, I, and I've asked a lot of diverse executives this question, it's like, so who would you point to as the model of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion in business? You know, the one that they, they just got it right and they're moving forward. And universally, 
without fail, I get silence. And then the second thing is, let me think about it. And the third is, I actually can't think of one that has sustained it. And, and, and many companies, um, including ours, we're all making incredible steps toward it. And some have gone further than others, but we haven't crossed this boundary yet. And, and, and I've asked the question, so why? We've been at it a long time. And I think what has been missing is something that has been added recently, and that is the E and D and I, equity. You know, um, we've learned that you have to have diversity and, and have a critical mass of people. Because if you don't have the critical mass, the only one syndrome becomes a real problem because you're the only one in the room and you're always the outlier. You're always going to stand out. Uh, um, uh, and it has kind of this distorted effect on diverse executives. Some will speak up more, some will speak up less, but it's distorted. Critical mass matters a lot. And I think we learned a lot about that in, as we are moving down the path of gender equality. Um, we can see that critical mass makes a big difference. So, so the diversity piece, I think, is important. The inclusion piece that I belong here is actually important. But what the conclusion I'm coming to is that inclusion is often an outcome. You know, you feel more included if you are given, or if you're empowered, if you're supported, if you feel it's safe for you for you to be there. And so the equity piece of making sure people are safe, that they're seen and understood, but most importantly, that you give them what they need to unlock their potential. And, and, and that's such a critical shift from where we've been before because underlying the previous notion of DNI was equality. Let's give everyone the same thing and then, uh, then say now it's a fair game. Um, but when you peel back what people actually need to move forward, they need different things actually to advance. And if you give them that, suddenly you, you, you're in a, in, a, in a vastly different position. And, and Sarah, I think this is about, um, there's a great cartoon that I saw that I think really captures as well. There's a race that's happening and there's a fence uh, and behind the fence are three people and they're standing on pedestals of equal size. They, unfortunately, there are different heights. Two of the people standing on those pedestals of equal size can look right over the fence and they can talk about the race. The person who's too short can't see over the fence, but that might be the person who unlocks, who gives you the best commentary on that race, who has the most information about that race. And so give the person the ped higher pedestal, they can actually see what's happening in the race. And the last thing I'll say of this is, is this, if, if we're not confident and not, and don't fully believe that this is, uh, our lives depend on it, look at happened with the COVID-19 vaccines. Two women actually led the development, were critical to the development of two of the vaccines. You know, Katalin Karikos, who's a, a Hungarian immigrant, um, she led M mRNA research that led to the Pfizer BioNTech uh, uh, vaccine, and Kazmikia Corbett. Uh, was one of the lead scientists on the Moderna vaccine. And, and, and imagine if they were not part of it, what, what would that mean for us? They were critical to leading to the vaccine. And you can apply that same logic down the line. The, the people who may be the solution to our most complex problems may be diverse executives, but it's rarely alone, it's in combination with other people. And that's why I said, it's not just about black, indigenous and other people of color, it's about all of us. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, well, well said. And I, I'm always um, really interested in not just in the kind of we put a lot of emphasis on the person needing to help embody that, um, as opposed to the culture and the, the the system that you're in. And I think that's what the last year has really revealed in a very um, you know it's made us naked in that respect. It's really brought that to the fore in a way I think is really great and powerful. It has, and, and you know, uh, the, it's the environment. But now in the business, what I'm also seeing, and, and what the, the thing that worries me the most is the lack of consciousness in some of the leaders and the managers. Like, if you really want to get past DEI, if you want to get uh, um, people focused on improving life in general and pe for people on the planet, there's a certain level of consciousness that has to occur within our managers and, and leaders. And, and I'll pick DEI since we're, we're focused on it. But if you really want to advance DEI, these are general ideas that help people overall. Um, you need to be able to manage tension, right? Um, diverse views, but finding common ground. Um, you need to be able to catalyze empathy. Um, you know, can you actually ask, uh, ask a question in a way that's humble? Um, can you listen in a way that's motivational? I, I don't know if you've ever, some, some people can listen so great. I mean, like uh, I've seen people um, sit across and they, they lean in and they listen in, in such a way that it just draws you in. Um, these are skills that managers need to develop in, in order to be 
better managers and better leaders, but to unlock some of this is a certain level of consciousness and self-awareness that's involved in, in, that, in that process. And, and, and if there's something that worries me, it's that piece of it, changing manager capability so that they can unlock the potential of people. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And kind of takes us back to where we started in terms of uh, thinking about your own, not just pers- a purpose, but your personal development um, in, in tune with that purpose and what you believe and then the how that you're gonna, you know, how you're gonna bring that to bear. Go- going back to um, the conscious leader again, it, perhaps you could share with us some of your sort of top tips or things that you think are important as you as you look to develop yourself as a conscious leader. And you've already mentioned a couple. Yeah, yeah, Sarah, I actually think it starts, and this is why I said I felt so fortunate, it starts with self-awareness, um, you know, understanding um, who you are, what motivates you, uh, understanding your personal triggers, understanding how your effect on other people, uh, understanding how you respond in different environments. That self-awareness is, is so important. You have to be conscious of that in knowing, in knowing yourself on that level, but also knowing yourself on a much deeper level. Like what is your personal purpose? And, and I, I'm fully aware there's gonna be a segment of people who will, will say, well, that feels incredibly touchy-feely. What does that have to do with business? Uh, uh, why do I have to go uh, on this introspective journey? Um, and my answer to that is, is this, is, is, is that ultimately this is all about people. It's the people that are working for you and working with you. It's about the relationships you have. Uh, it's about the way you build trust uh, and trust is about relationships. And it's really hard to do that if you don't know who you are and you don't know how you affect other, other people. And so I think that personal journey of understanding you know, what energizes you, what you're good at, and what contribution you want to make to the world and being self-aware is the first step. You know, know thyself is, is, is kind of the first step, I think. Um, but the second one for me is this kind of deeper and more expansive view of the role of business. Um, you know, um, if, you, if you peel it all the way back, so why do we even have business? Because you know, we take it all for granted. It's like, oh, you know, of course, business should have certain tax advantages. Business should be able to use the roads and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the infrastructure of the city without any additional charge. We just take it all for granted. But if you ask the question, well, why does business exist? Why do we have it? It better be to improve life, you know, to improve people on the planet. And, and because otherwise, why do we have it? And so I think getting more businesses and leaders to get conscious about going beyond profit. Yeah, profit is an outcome that you have to have to stay in business. Yes, do it. Um, we support that. But getting beyond that and really understanding what is the ultimate goal of the business and, and how does it serve, how, how does it serve um, and make a positive contribution to society? I think that's the key, the key. And, and this is why purpose-driven leadership combined with purpose-driven talent, I think it's going to be so important uh, for this next wave of, of conscious leadership. And, and the last thing I'll say is this, the reason I'm, and you might notice this, I'm an, I'm an optimistic person. I believe the future is going to be better. Um, um, but what gets me very excited though, is that when I see talent, the best talent coming in, um, they're not asking the question about, uh, you know, what does your business do? Um, they're asking the question is, how do you make a positive contribution to society? And they're deciding whether to come into the company or not based on that. Um, they, they believe, and I believe, they deserve to work at a place where they're feeling, they feel like they make a positive contribution to society. And I think that's gonna accelerate this whole uh, uh, requirement that leaders become much more conscious. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, like you, I'm, I'm really excited about the change that's possible now in a way that hasn't felt quite so present for, for some time. So it's, it's an exciting time. Um, as a final question, I just wanted um, you to maybe project forward in time and, and, and think about what you've achieved and tell me where, where, where does that feel good? When you look back, what's the thing that you would like to look back on and remember most of all? Wow, <laughs> that's a great. <laughs> I'll just bring the small questions. On. You, know, you know what? I mean, here's here's how here's how I measure my own success. It's um, it, it's really not any single thing that I've done or that I will do in terms of some um, campaign or some um, kind of business accomplishment. 
Uh, it's really more around how many people have I helped and by how much. And, um, you know, that will be my metric of, of success. And so um, if in fact, some of the things that, that, that I'm doing that are perceived as successful, if it's, if it's just newsworthy and, 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 and I've gotten an award for it, um, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll welcome that, it's fine. But um, I'm more focused on, has it helped people? And, and um, has it helped to expand people's potential? And if so, that to me is, is the thing that lasts. It's the thing that people remember, because you always remember, at least for me, you remember those who've, who've helped you move forward. Uh, those who, no matter how small the step is, so those who've removed a barrier for you, those who, who kind of change your way of thinking so that you feel less of a burden on, on yourself every day, those who've given you the sense of rejuvenation. And so for me, it's, it's that measurement more than anything else. Uh, and I'm hopeful, again, because um, I, I, I believe that there are a lot more people and increasingly more people who are aligned with this idea that it's about people first. And so whether you think about technology, which I love, uh, it's not that technology is about people first, whether you think about investment, well, which I love, uh, it's not about simply return on investment, it's about how do you help people advance and, be, and experience financial well-being. And that lens for me applies to, to virtually everything that I do today and going forward. That's wonderful. I love the link with um, purpose, people, and being a conscious leader. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Thank you.